Well, let me introduce uh, Father O'Malley and uh, tell you a little bit about him. And first off, a confession. And uh, they say confession is good for the soul. I'm a huge John O'Malley fan. I've known his, of his work, uh, particularly what happened at Vatican II. Uh, he's come out with a recent book on the Council of Trent. Several people since he's, uh, since he's been at Emory have pleaded for him to write one of Vatican, the first Vatican councils to which he has politely indicated that he's not. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think that indicates just how good these books are. They're quite readable. They're very scholarly, but they're quite readable. Uh, and every single person in this room could, uh, could gain a lot from uh, reading his work. Uh, John O'Malley is a Jesuit. Um, and, uh, and, and for a Dominican sinner, this indicates just how powerful he is that we're inviting a Jesuit. Uh, I'm kidding. But uh, uh, he's not only a scholar, he's an award-winning scholar. He's won several uh, awards uh, for his writing, uh, not just in the field of church history, church councils. He's also written on the Jesuits. He's written on the history of Italy and many, many other subjects. You can see him regularly in magazines like America and other places. Uh, and he has brought, I think, a really deep and profound understanding of what the Second Vatican Council is about. And that is so very important when we're talking about the Synod on the Family, we're talking about Pope Francis, uh, and thinking about th where we are as a church and where we're going to move forward. So uh, I think with that, I think I, there's nothing more I could say to prepare you. Uh, I think you're in for a real treat. I know I am. Father O'Malley. Am I on? Yes, I am. Yes. Well, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm glad Phil didn't tell all the stories he knows about me when he introduced me, namely that I'm a good poker player and things like this. The, uh, so my topic basically is uh, the Synod and Vatican II, and of course that brings Pope Francis into the scene. Let me tell you a little bit about my relationship with the Second Vatican Council. My real field is uh, really 16th century Italy, and, uh, but I happen to be in Rome writing my dissertation while the Second Vatican Council was in session. I was there for two years at the council. And uh, I was just a graduate student and had no real direct relationship to the council, but was in, at a couple of the public sessions. And then every afternoon, there was a press briefing in different language groups. So I'd sneak into those and uh, uh, try to find out as much as I could about what was really going on. And this was just because I was a Catholic and a priest but I also had a professional interest because I was working on a 16th century reformer. I was wondering what the relationship between the 16th century and the 20th century was. So it wasn't just curiosity and just sort of my own spiritual life, but a professional interest as well. But I never thought that I would ever write about the council. However, uh, in 1971, I wrote my first article and I thought it'd be my first and my last. Well. More articles, more this, more this, finally a book and so forth. And I, I still have a couple articles coming out this year. And I say I'm kind of a combination of Pontius Pilate and Lady Macbeth. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to wash my hands of Vatican II, but I can't do it. That, that damn spot's still there. Because I do love the council. Let me tell you something about myself. Um, uh, Jorge Mario Bergoglio. Uh, have I ever met him? I think so. Uh, uh, we were together for three and a half months, 1974-75, in Rome during the Jesuits' 32nd General Congregation. That's the highest body in the Society of Jesus. And we dealt with all kinds of extremely important issues. It was a very difficult meeting. And he was there and I was there, about 230 of us. I must have met him. He must have met me. But neither of us remembers this. Uh, <laughs> Then we were together again in Rome about nine years later for another general congregation. He was there, I was there, blah. So, sorry, that's the story. <laughs> Basically what I'm talking about tonight are two themes. One is the Synod and one is Vatican II. And really there's just two, in my book, two aspects of one reality and I try to fit Pope Francis into this. So, with Vatican II, as I say, I, uh, my book on Vatican II was published in 2008, and I was invited to give a number of lectures, and I did that. But uh, uh, I'd come home and be very discouraged, because it's 
interesting to me, but it seemed to be sort of dead in the water. Uh, then the, uh, with the Synod, that was established in the, during the Second Vatican Council, 1965, and that too seemed to be dead in the water. Nothing seemed to be happening. Uh, well, that's all changed. Uh, that's changed very dramatically, and the reason it's changed is because of Pope Francis. And I really believe that uh, the mystery of Pope Francis if you want to understand him, you must understand the Second Vatican Council. And to understand it at a profound level, but at basically a very intelligible and simple level. Uh, I'll try to sort of uh, elaborate on that tonight. So he's, uh, he's really, he's given not only to the Council and to the Synod, but to the Catholic world at large, and even beyond the Catholic world, a real jolt of energy, hasn't it? It's just a jolt of energy. And that energy uh, touches on the Council and the Synod. So, what about him in terms of these realities? Well, he's the first pope in 50 years not to have participated in the Council. Uh, this, uh, in my book, is an advantage. Uh, I feel that Pope Paul VI, Pope Benedict, uh, uh, Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict XVI, on some level, were still fighting the battle of the council, the battles of the council. Bergoglio was a theological student when the council ended. He was ordained in 1969, the council ended in 1965. And somehow or other, he sort of got the, the council pure, I think. He was uh, sort of got it, uh, must have had some really good teachers because he seems, to, from my way of thinking, really have understood it and grasped what it was about. So I think that he not only understands it, but he really appropriated it. It's often remarked that compared with his predecessors, he uh, speaks so little explicitly about the council. And I think that's because it's so much a part of him. Uh, He's, it's right inside him, and he doesn't even think that he's talking about the council, but that's exactly what he's talking about and doing. So, the synod, the same thing uh, with this synod that we just had, it's so different from every synod since 1965. And it's much livelier and much more uh, in terms of what a synod really should be. I'll talk about that more later. That's just to get the uh, basic premise out there. So let's take a look at Vatican II. What's the first thing we need to say about it? I think the first thing is, it was not a sacristy affair. We sometimes identify Vatican II with the liturgy, so that was important, but it was not a sacristy affair. When John XXIII convoked it, he wanted to use this as a way of reconciling with uh, the other Christian churches. So it was an outreach there from the very beginning. And in his allocution that opened the council in 1962, October the 11th, he tried to set the tone for the council. So very, it's a beautiful document. We know he wrote every word himself, revised it and revised it. And the line that sticks out for me is, he told the bishops gathered there, uh, what you want to do is to show the church to be the loving mother of all, benign, patient, full of mercy and goodness. Loving mother of all, point one. October the 11th, 1962. Point two, October the 20th, 1962. This is a document, that's an official document of the council, but it's uh, been lost sight of, but extremely important. So before the council started, the bishops themselves, on their own initiative, decided they wanted to publish a message to the world about what they were trying to do in the council. I'll just quote to you one of the sort of the central paragraph and the central idea. We urgently turn our thoughts to the problems by which human beings are, be afflicted to, are being afflicted today. Hence, our concern goes out to the lowly, the poor, and the powerless. Like Christ, 
we would have pity on the multitude, heavily burdened by hunger, misery, and lack of education. As we undertake our work, therefore, we want to pursue whatever contributes to a genuine community of peoples. Then, in December 1965, as the Council ended, they published the decree on Gaudium et Spes on the Church of the Modern World. One of the very striking features of that document is, for the first time in history, here is a council addressing not simply bishops, not simply Catholic faithful, but to all people of goodwill. Uh, this is an extraordinary outreach. So that's sort of premise, not a sacristy affair. Then let's look at the council somewhat with Pope Francis's eyes. What do we have to say? The Second Vatican Council is a very complex, very rich event. There's no one word that captures everything that needs to be captured, uh, and yet there is a kind of simplicity to it. And one of its unique features is that unlike previous councils, which were a collection really of rules or ordinances or laws, not necessarily with a lot of relationship one to the other, Vatican, Second Vatican Council has a coherent unity to it. And one of the documents builds upon another. For instance, the document on the bishops could not be put on the floor of the council until the council had dealt fully with the document on the church because the document on the church also dealt with bishops, so until that was settled, the document on the, on the bishops couldn't go there. So there's a coherence there. What this means is that unlike previous councils, there are certain themes, certain issues, certain orientations that pervade the council. They're based on individual documents, uh, but they transcend them in that they're repeated and amplified and so forth as the council goes on. So we used to talk about the spirit of the council. This is what the spirit of the council is. It's something that's above any one particular document, but still is rooted in all the documents of the council. So I've got six themes here that I'll talk about that I think get us to the heart of the council and to uh, actually the uh, uh, pontificate of Pope Francis. Collegiality, that is the bishops working together have a responsibility for the whole church, not necessary for their diocese, in union with the Holy See. Secondly, the importance of the local church. Third, dialogue. Fourth, reconciliation with other Christians and other religions. Other religions. Five, servant leader. And sixth, the one I was talking about at the beginning, uh, not a sacristy affair, an outreach to others. So that's kind of an overview of the council, which I'll talk about in more detail in a moment. What about synod? What does synod mean? Well, in ecclesiastical language, it is a perfect synonym for a council. Uh, they're used interchangeably. For instance, the Council of Trent refers to itself as Hec Sancta, uh, Hec Sancta Synodus, this holy synod. The official documents of Vatican II, as the published documents, 53 volumes, the official title is the Acta Synodalia, the Synodal Acts of the Second Vatican Council. Perfect synod. So what's a council? Well, a council is a meeting, principally of bishops, gathered in Christ's name to make decisions binding on the church, the local church or the general church. Uh, I said principally of bishops because until Vatican I, every so-called ecumenical council had an important lay, the, lay uh, participation. The first Vatican I is the first council that did not take place. There was kind of a token participation in Vatican II, but unlike previous councils. <coughs> How many councils were there? Well, in terms of worldwide or church-wide, the council, the Catholic Church rec recognizes 21, the first being Nicaea 325, the last being the Second Vatican Council in the middle of the 20th century. 
but there were hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of local councils. Beginning, we have good records from the third century, therefore in the 200s. These were important North African councils that made decisions that then had ramifications for the whole church. So, to put it bluntly, the church was basically governed by synods up into the modern era. And although respect was always paid to the Holy See and to the successor of St. Peter, it was these local councils and other councils where the big decisions were made, the important decisions were made. So that's, that's how the church was coming. So you see what an important concept this is. So what had happened? By the time the Second Vatican Council, it had sort of been almost forgotten. There were some synods here and there, but almost forgotten and not very important. During the council with uh, uh, the uh, doctrine of Episcopal collegiality, the question raised, how is this going to work? What, what instrument will make it important, viable, so it'll have an impact? Well, the council never got around to that. Pope Paul VI gave the council this synod of bishops. And this is often interpreted as a collegial uh, way to implement collegiality, but that's not what Paul VI had in mind. Because this, as he understood the synod, it was strictly a consultative body. It's called by the Pope, the Pope set the agenda, and the bishops were there to give him advice, which is not exactly what you mean by a collegiality, by the bishops being a kind of junior partner with the Pope in church decisions. So that's where it stayed until Pope uh, Francis came along. He was, as I say, uh, dead in the water. So let's take a look at these themes and see how Francis is involved in them. And then what I want to say basically is that uh, although I insist there's no one word that sums up the council and uh, no one word that sums up what Pope Francis is about, but if there is a word, I think it's the synod because it's, it's a dis distillation of all sorts of things that uh, I'll now try to elaborate upon. So all these Vatican II themes all flow into the synod, the idea of the synod, or synodalia, <laughs> which is a Pope Francis word, synodalia, this synodal element of the church's life. Uh, how's that to function in the future? So the lightning rod of the council was collegiality. That is, as I said, the uh, cooperation of the bishops with the pope in the government of the church. Uh, and it was a lightning rod decree in the council of doctrine, had a terrible time getting through, and was, even once it was passed, was, there were efforts to kind of mitigate it and so forth. But it is sort of the big insight into what the council was trying to do to not simply decentralize the governance of the church to some extent, but to uh, make the whole church much more participatory and to incite our own personal responsibility. This was also expressed in the concept of the church as the people of God. So, uh, but this also was a principle that the council continued to elaborate for every level of the church. So bishops had a collegial relationship with the pope. Bishops had a collegial relationship with their clergy. And the clergy, the priests, the pastors had a collegial relationship with their people. So it's a pervasive theme and issue at the Second Vatican Council. So what about Pope Francis? Well, one of the first things he did was create that G8, or now G9, those cardinals from around the world to meet with him to discuss these problems like the Vatican Bank, the Reform of Roman Curia, so forth. And then the big move was the Synod itself. Uh, so he breathed new life into it. First of all, that questionnaire beforehand uh, didn't amount to much, but the principle was there for the first time in the history of the church before a Synod or a Council, a questionnaire. Can you believe it? Uh, really extraordinary. And then his insistence with the bishops 
that they were free to speak, they would not to, were not to worry about somebody frowning on them or saying the wrong thing, and then there was no prepared statement to be issued once they left. Uh, it was still up in the air, so the Senate has two parts. We just had the first part, second part's in October. So, uh, Francis, in this dramatic way, breathes life not only into the Senate, but also ties this into the Second Vatican Council. Another great theme of the Council occurs, begins with the first document on the liturgy and goes all the way through, is the, uh, the authority of the local church. That, of course, the Holy See has the final word, but that, uh, for instance, in the decree on the liturgy was, a, again, a hot topic with that decree that local bishops' conferences had the right to make certain determinations about the liturgy. It did not all come from the Congregation of Rites. So this kind of validation of the local church, the, uh, along with that, the council tried to validate local or national Episcopal conferences to give them more authority to make decisions and so forth to move their own way. And uh, then bishops were ordained the idea about the ordination was that uh, they did not just receive their basic authority from the Pope, but that they got this by virtue of their ordination, that it was directly with, connected with the sacrament of uh, ordination. Pope Francis, well, a number of things, but uh, when he introduced himself on October the 13th, 2013, the people of Rome, he referred to himself as the Bishop of Rome right there, locate himself right in the local church. And then I think most uh, extraordinary was, uh, while he was still Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he reinvigorated CELAM, that is the Conference of the Latin American Bishops. This had been allowed, the last time it had met was 1992. Right after the Second Vatican Council, it had been a very powerful voice, and especially with this outreach to the poor and to the marginalized and so forth in Latin America. And uh, kind of was under a cloud. And as I say, by 1992, it was out of existence, basically. So with the cooperation of Pope Benedict, uh, uh, Bergoglio was able to reinvigorate it. And they met uh, in 2012 and published some very important documents. And when it was over, Bergoglio got a standing ovation from all the Latin American bishops for his work, what he had done, the way he handled the meeting. So that's a wonderful example of his uh, concern for the local church and realizing the importance and dignity of the local church. Then dialogue. Well, that became almost the most characteristic word of Vatican II. It was given to the council by Pope Paul VI in his encyclical and uh, uh, was abused and so forth, but it was uh, again, a uh, uh, good instance of the councils taking a look at horizontal relationships. Not simply everything's not simply top down, but the requirement to talk to one another, and as Bergoglio himself defines it, not to I'll compromise a little bit and you compromise a little bit, but simply to understand the other, uh, to maybe appreciate where the other's coming from, and then see what happens after that. Uh, breathtaking. Absolutely breathtaking is the fact that as Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he sat down with Rabbi Abraham Skorka over the course of months. They had a dialogue on a wide range of topics, and these were then later published, first of all in Spanish, now in English, and many other languages. No Catholic prelate in the history of the church ever did anything like that. If that isn't a bold move, I mean, and so the kind of courage he has in self-possession, but it's dialogue on the highest level and the most respectful level, and Rabbi Skork is still a rabbi, and the Pope's still Pope. I mean, but uh, this was a, really a, a breakthrough 
moment of, I had the privilege of having lunch with a few other people with Rabbi Skorka last year at Georgetown and hear him speak, and they have a really deep friendship. I mean, it's, it's really striking how close they are to one another. So, and then with the Synod, again, as I said before, uh, speak honestly, speak. We want to hear what you say. We want to know where you're coming from, but don't be afraid. Someone asked me, where's the Holy Spirit in all this? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't know where the Holy Spirit is. But if the Holy Spirit's any place, the Holy Spirit's in honesty. And I think that's what uh, Pope Francis was asking the bishops to be, to be honest, not to be afraid, to say, to speak their mind, and then see, see what happens afterwards. So uh, at, the end of the, at the end of that first period, when it's at allocution, to the, at, as it, that session ended, that first period ended, last October, he said, what we've done, we, we've walked together, and we've had uh, moments of light and moments of darkness, but we did this together, and trying to understand one another, and uh, uh, that's, that's good, uh, that's where we're able to find God's will and see the road ahead, uh, but if secrets are not good, and that's what can often happen. So I just the other day ran across this uh, definition of the ideal leader. If the ideal leader is a person who walks alongside you, and I think that's what Bergoglio was trying to tell these bishops, that we were, all, we were walking alongside one another on this road, trying to find our way out. So other religions, the, uh, another extremely important and, and very difficult document that in the council that almost was withdrawn from, from, from the agenda, it was so difficult, caused so much controversy, was Nostra Aetate, the document on non-Christian religions. As you know, that started out as a document on the Jews, put on the agenda by John XXIII himself, and then bit by bit it got expanded. So it had a hard time in the council, but finally was passed, and it's the shortest document of the council, and it's basically, wider than this, but basically about Muslims and Jews, Catholic relationship with those two. Uh, for me, I see that document as giving the Catholic Church a new mission. It's an old mission on one level, but a new mission, a mission to act as an agent of reconciliation among religions. And I need not tell you how badly that is needed in our world today. It's a very difficult task, there's all kinds of pitfalls. But uh, I have to say, give John well, Paul VI, but especially John Paul II, and in his own way Benedict, and now Francis, they're going ahead with this in a very bold and courageous way. So, uh, with, again, bringing up the Skorka case with Francis, washing the feet of that Muslim uh, woman, and so forth. Then, the next item, well, while still on that point, Francis's insistence with all Catholics and with the church and with the bishops and with the priests to go to the periphery. Don't stand on the church steps waiting for people to come to you but go out, extend your hand, go, go be a missionary, go, go to the periphery, go to the marginalized, go to those who don't have anybody to look after them, but who may belong to us, at least potentially. So uh, the Roman Catholic Church in this vision is bigger than the Church of Roman Catholics. And it's a bigger reality than simply practicing Catholics. It's a bigger reality trying to move out and touch those who need to be touched by God's hand. Not a sacristy affair. Then a servant leader. Very interesting thing happened in the council. So a traditional description of bishops and priests, what they're about, is this triad, prophet, priest, and king. So prophet, one who speaks in God's name and on God's behalf, priest, one who offers prayers for the people, and 
uh, king, one who governs or rules. Well, there were, that was in the council that was applied to bishops, it was applied to priests, it was applied, applied to lay people. In all these applications, of course, it was slightly redefined, but there was one constant redefinition, and that is the word king. It was consistently redefined as servant. So the theme of servant leader is pervades the council, and uh, it's this need of a leader for humility, uh, to be able to say, I don't know, I need help, and I'm here to serve, not to tell you how to lead your life necessarily directly, but to, to be with you and to serve you. And uh, the, uh, to listen to be corrected. And it seems to me that Francis, well, the great symbol is not living in the apostolic palace, right? Uh, uh, and then uh, his, uh, I have to tell you this story, at Georgetown, uh, two years ago, we had a young man graduate by the name of Luca Gianni. And Luca Gianni had a, a wonderful young man, had a very unusual passport. His passport was from Vatican City. And that's because his father, General Johnny, is the head of security in Vatican City. Uh, and I had the privilege of meeting General Johnny when, when, when Luca graduated. But in any case, the uh, story is told that when Pope Francis was about to take possession of his cathedral, John Lateran, a traditional procession from St. Peter's all the way across Rome to the Lateran, uh, he went up to General Johnny and said, uh, can I ride with you? And General Johnny replied, sure. Do you want to drive too? So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's the kind of response that he, uh, he, he elicits from people. More seriously, when he was made a cardinal, it's a wonderful quotation from him. He said, every ascent implies a descent. You must go down if you want to serve better. So, the synod requires making oneself little, listening to others, being ready to be corrected, being ready to change one's view, and so forth. Then finally, the final theme, which I've already talked about, is that the council is not a sacristy affair, it's outreach. Outreach to those in the, mar the margins, to the sinners, to the publicans, especially to those people who have belonged to the church, or uh, maybe still belong to the church, but are disaffected, uh, no problem of divorced Catholics, uh, uh, gay Catholics, uh, others along that line. So putting all this together, we don't have a pastoral program, but we do have a, uh, a pastoral mode, a pastoral way of operating. That is, to use Francis's word, it's synodal. That is to say, it combines, it seems to me, all these elements in itself to make a more or less coherent unity. So what I've been talking about is how the church, is the how of the church. How does the church behave? <coughs> is more about the character and spiritual grounding of the minister than about specific content. It's about how the how of ministry rather than what it is about. Uh, it is about inner conviction, away from certain mindsets, uh, or better, soul sets, to others, from certain values to others. For example, I have this little litany that I composed. It's uh, too extreme, but I think it makes the point. From monologue to dialogue, from ruling to serving, <coughs> from fault-finding to appreciation, from rivalry to partnership, from hostility to friendship, from passive acceptance to active engagement, from making pronouncements to listening, from alienation to reconciliation, uh, and as the old saying goes, what you are thunders so loud I can't hear what you say. So, 
It's a certain way of being. So what about the synod, this synod? Hot topics. It's about the family, which is a difficult enough topic in itself, but then it's sprawled out to these other issues. Uh, what about communion to, for the divorce? What about the whole problem of annulments, polygamy, all those issues? Uh, Honest talk, but disagreement. And the final report of that first period was praise of the family. So we don't want to forget that the synod was about the family. That was the point of it. And these other issues come up because we're talking about the family. So what was the outcome? Well, the outcome was wait and see. This was just part one of two parts. So there were no conclusions to that phase of the, and if you read the final document, it's a, a kind of a praise of the family and sort of skirts all these more difficult issues. I predict, I'm a terrible predictor, I predict <laughs> that uh, what will be the outcome of the part two? I think we're in for a lot of, dis people are in for a lot of disappointments. I don't see anything really dramatically changing. I could be wrong. Uh, the uh, why not? The Catholic Church moves slowly. Moreover, it is the Catholic Church. And where sort of gay issues are important in the North Atlantic world, maybe in the Latin American world, they're verboten issues in Africa. Polygamy is still practiced in Africa. It's verboten in the North Atlantic world. In the, South American world. So there's that whole problem of moving with the whole church. But here's the important point. Uh, crucial questions have been raised. They've not been squashed. And let's just see how time and reflection, where, where that leads us. Uh, so, if we focus on the content of this synod, the last document of, after part two, I think we're kind of missing the point. The important point is how this process has been put into shape and given impetus by Pope Francis. That is, it's kind of returned to the older tradition of synods that uh, the church is governed not simply, as Pius X said at the beginning of the 20th century, it's all very simple. The Pope tells the bishops what to do, the bishops tell the priests what to do. You know, end of, end of story. Uh, this is not what this synod is about, and this whole process of consultation, participation, and trying to be sensitive, dialogue with the world out there, dialogue with what are real issues in people's minds and lives, and see how we can deal with them in a, in, with integrity, and yet with sympathy, and with imagination, and creativity. So the people of God have a voice, because the laity was present at that first period, that we present at the second period, and uh, it seems to me that maybe what we're moving towards, or might move towards, at least in a, in a minimal way is a synodal church, a more synodal church. So let me end what I have to say by again quoting uh, St. John the 23rd. What was the council supposed to do? What the synod is supposed to do? What all ministry is supposed to do? To show the church to be the loving mother of all. Benign patient, full of mercy and goodness. Thank you. I think we're going to take some questions, and we have, uh, uh, we've got, we'll have, uh, Allison, do we have a 
Yeah, yeah microphone coming. Uh, so, uh, Father, would you, do you want to sit down if you would like to sit down? Yeah, fine. You okay? Yeah. Father's uh, a little bit tired. They put him under, he's been under, uh, he's been flying around and talking to, to priest conferences and everything else. So, you don't want to. Uh, no, I mean, I felt a little uh, queasy today, but I, you know, an audience brings. <laughs> <laughs> Gives me energy. The, uh, before we do that, why don't you take a moment and talk to the person next to you or some people next to you and say, here's what struck me, here's what I think was crazy, uh, here's what I didn't understand, here's a question I have. Kind of you know, stir the pot a little bit before we open it up, if that helps. Okay? So uh, That sounds great. Talk. <laughs> Identify yourself and uh, questions, comments. Yes, back there, I don't know you. I, I haven't had the opportunity to do this in 20 years at least. But John, I was struck by the- He's a former student, so. <laughs> uh, I was struck by your, your quote from Pius X. And I'm curious in terms of this notion of it being synodal, collegial, um, going to the periphery, does it make a difference that Francis is the first pope from a religious order since the early 19th century? That basically, since the early 19th century, our popes have been from the diocesan hierarchy. Does that make a difference? I mean, in your thoughts. Well, I'm often asked, uh, what difference does it make with Francis that he's a Jesuit? And uh, kind of hard to figure out, but I think it makes a big difference. And uh, for two reasons especially. One is, uh, one thing the Jesuits do, they make the 30-day spiritual exercises twice in their life. And moreover, Bergoglio was master of novices for several years, and therefore guided young Jesuits through those, that 30-day experience. So he knows those exercises very well. And I mean, the first week of the exercise is divided into four weeks. The first week is all about self-knowledge and uh, basically knowing one's weakness, knowing one's failures, uh, knowing, you know, how one's chased down the wrong path, not to uh, sort of beat oneself up, but to uh, kind of move on and be aware of God's mercy and love. And it seems to me that one thing about Francis that uh, strikes every witness is, you know, to this, all the spiritual exercises, but certainly he's a very humble person and a very free person. And uh, another thing, in the uh, Jesuit constitutions, uh, it was written by St. Ignatius himself, divided into ten parts. Part nine is about the general of the order, the superior general. And one part of that is the qualities the general should have. So, on one level, it's a portrait of the ideal general, and on another level, it's a portrait of the ideal Jesuit. And Bergoglio would know that document well. So what are the qualities the, Jesuit, the general should have? Well, first of all, should be a man of prayer, a man of virtue, a man who knows how to balance a firmness with tenderness. And another quality that I think is unique for a religious order is to be magnanimous to be a person of great soul and to undertake great tasks. It's a beautiful, I wish I had the, uh, the quotation here to read to you. It's a, it's a beautiful passage. And uh, so he should be a person of great soul because he must bear the weakness of many and he must undertake great doings for the service of God our Lord and uh, be willing to do this even though he be criticized and be threats and entreaties from people of high, high rank and so forth continue what he thinks is convinced is for the God's greater service, even if this means suffering death itself. So I think, again, that's a quality of a leader to be able to move out and have it. And Francis certainly has this boldness. So that's part of his personality, but I do think that that's uh, 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 an 
element. The third element is, as I mentioned, we were together for the 32nd and 33rd General Congregation, and especially the 32nd Congregation. But these were real debates. I mean, these were very serious issues we were dealing with, and people had all kinds of different views. So and the great thing about it, when I went home and reported in my province, I said, well, you know, we disagreed about a lot of things, but you always knew that what you were hearing was honest opinion, and that uh, people were move, motivated by what they thought was the best for the society of Jesus and the best for the church. And I think that's maybe the model Francis had in mind for the Synod, that he had that, had that experience of how that could work in a certain context. So I think that, you know, uh, and then <laughs> I really think that uh, the fact that he didn't live in the Apostolic Palace, I mean, he, of course, this is been true of him when he was Archbishop too, but uh, you know, the Jesuit Curia in Rome is uh, what, 200 yards from the Papal Curia. Boy, do you walk into two different worlds. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the Jesuit Curia, it's like old folks at home. I mean, the, uh, you know, the generals there at the table with everybody else, and uh, there's no protocol. You, uh, 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 it's all buffet style, and people take turns waiting table, things like this. So, anyway, that's a long answer to your question, but maybe it throws a little bit light on my personal opinion on this stuff. Yes. Well, the Senate has been dead for about 50 years. What hope do we have is that after uh, Pope Francis, it won't be buried again? Yeah, well, that's the big question. We don't have any guarantee. Uh, history takes strange turns. Uh, there's no guarantee whatsoever. Uh, I like to think that uh, it'd be a little hard to reverse this process once it's, you know, sort of established just as someone to reverse the other process. But uh, no guarantee whatsoever. So this is a, this is our concern. Is, we were talking about that at dinner tonight about the whole problem of security of the Pope. That poor General John A. is going crazy because the Pope is very hard to control. I mean, he goes out into the crowds in St. Peter's and, you know, it'd be very easy for something to happen to him. So, yeah, good question. But that's about all I can say. There's no guarantee. There's no guarantee in this life, right? Yeah. yeah. How is it possible for this synod to seriously to address questions about the family with so little representation for women? Yeah, well, that's, yeah. So the question is, how can the city really seriously address this question of family with such a minimal representation of women? It's a big fall, a big problem. Uh, and uh, the, uh, there's, women should be better represented, their voices should be better heard. I think, I mean, a lot of women don't agree with me on this, but I think Francis, he's not as sensitive on this issue as he might be, but he, he does realize he has a problem and he needs to sort of get that feminine voice in there. So uh, that's been a problem all along on all these issues. And again, what, what we're dealing with, again, seems to me is kind of a process. I said, what's a, what is a synod? A meeting principally of bishops, but a lot of lay people have participated. And what people don't realize is the Eighth Ecumenical Council. All those first councils met in present-day Turkey and were called by the emperor, not the pope, but called by the emperor, with one exception. The eighth was called by the Empress Irene. Uh, and it met, she addressed it when it first met. So that's uh, kind of an anomaly in the history of the, of the councils. But uh, there is room for more voices. Yeah. Uh, my impression of Vatican II was there was an emphasis placed on personal responsibility and informed conscience. And the second thing is, following on Pope Pius XII, uh, circumstances, context matters in issues in making decisions. Is, that, is this synod going to change some of these issues, for example, on the use of contraception? 
Yeah. If you make a judgment that it's important to raise your three children to get them education and on their way in life, and you can't afford to have four or five, that's context. That, I think, is best for our, our children, we'll say. How does that play out? Well, I think that that's a, a, so did you get the question? How does context play out in all these things, especially some of these issues like contraception and so forth? The, uh, I think bit by bit, uh, it's beginning to play a very important role. But it's, it's a very gradual process. For instance, during the council, uh, Gaudi met Spes, the uh, decree on the church in the modern world, uh, Cart uh, Father Ratzinger then objected to it because it was too sociological, it was too focused on what was going on out there rather than on principles. And uh, this is a strength of Catholicism that stems us on principles, but it's also a weakness. Uh, and this taking account of the lived reality is a an important factor in a moral judgment. And in the uh, olden times, with the Jesuits, but not just with the Jesuits, they developed this theory of moral decision making called casuistry, which was casual, took account of cases. So it took account of concrete instances and how that affected your moral judgment, how you dealt with principles. And then with the Vatican II again, the emphasis on the signs of the times, so what's out there. So I agree with you, it's uh, uh, something that needs to be developed. Uh, and uh, it's in a very embryonic stage right now, I'd say, but maybe it will grow. I hope it grows. Yeah. Get back there? Yeah, see, there's this growing split in the church between those who feel that Vatican II was, uh, went too far, and particularly the spirit of Vatican II, they say, is carried too far. Uh, these traditionalists, and then those who are more progressive in their thinking and, and are looking forward to this kind of consultative process and, and uh, that, that Francis has initiated. How do you see this uh, synodal process <coughs> dealing with this terrible split that we have in our church at this point? Yeah, well, I mean, Point one, there have always been splits like this in the church. Uh, seems to be almost human nature. I mean, really desperate splits. Uh, in the 17th, 18th century, the Jansenists and Jansenist party and sort of the rest of the church and so forth, so uh, all these heresies. So uh, this is not a new phenomenon, and we're, I think, more aware of it in the United States than elsewhere. But in France, are pretty aware of it and so forth. Not so much in Italy. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, kind of lost my train of thought there, the, uh, uh, I've lost my train of thought, so give me that question again. <laughs> this, this kind of growing split between people who... Oh yeah, okay, yeah, the, uh, so, I mean, Francis is trying to say that this message is, can't we talk to one another, can't we see if we find a common ground. Now, you've got to be willing to listen to that. You've got to be willing to listen to that. If you don't listen to that, then, then we're stuck. We're stuck. Uh, so, uh, you've got to hear that part of his message, which is part of the message of the Second Vatican Council. So, if you don't hear that, then we're stuck. So, that's the way. And uh, the, uh, well, let me go with that, I guess. Yes. Is the Eastern, Eastern Church involved in this dialogue? Well, yes, they've always been involved. Uh, and, you know, there's a, been an ongoing, for instance, in the United States, an ongoing uh, Roman Catholic Orthodox dialogue that's been going on ever since the Council. A good friend of mine has been on it from the very beginning. So that's been going on. And, you know, this whole problem of the Eastern Orthodox and then the Russian Orthodox as well and so forth, the, uh, uh, it's a long-standing problem. And both sides have tried at different points to try to come together. Uh, not never quite made it. But I think what's interesting is that uh, uh, at uh, Pope Francis's installation, uh, Patriarch, I can't remember his name, from Constantinople, 
uh, what is it? Bartholomew. Bartholomew, this patriarch Bartholomew came to, to uh, Francis' installation. They met since then. That's really a tremendous sign. So that's not going to be easy. None of this stuff is going to be easy. But uh, Francis is, I mean, he's a phenomenon. And uh, uh, if anybody can move it along, like he's the person. I mean, he's, he's, he, he listens and uh, he's uh, uh, attractive and seems very reasonable. So uh, these are big issues. Yeah, over there. Or, uh, um, you've outlined for us very clearly this uh, synodal spirit and the synodal process which is going on. Could the synodal process, theoretically, uh, lead to a more decentralized institution or decentralized authority, such that we would have different parts of the church making different decisions and the decisions would be coexisting, almost in a federal sense of the word. I hope the question is clear. Did you hear it? I know. Yeah. You heard it all right? Repeat yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll make it a little more important. That is, if we have Hold on, you have to hold it correctly. The uh, Father has clearly outlined for us this synodal spirit which guided um, the Vatican Council and the current Senate and the synodal process. But my question is whether a synodal process and spirit could lead to a more decentralized institution or a decentralized authority such that we would have different parts of the church taking authoritative, recognized positions, which would be authoritative and recognized by a central authority, something a little more federal in spirit. Yeah, I think that's a very good question, and that's, of course, the way the church, as I mentioned earlier, that's the way church, church functioned for basically 1,500 years. Of course, the situation was different then. You didn't have all the means of communication, so we know exactly what's going on in every part of the world instantaneously, which creates uh, Great communication but also creates problems. So the whole idea behind uh, the uh, Episcopal collegiality, emphasis on the local church of Vatican II, was to temper the high degree of centralization in the Roman Curia. And now everybody, of course, agreed and subscribed to the doctrine of dogma of papal, papal primacy. There's never any question of that. But how that primacy functioned was another question altogether and can it not function in a more synodal fashion? And that would lead to uh, important decisions being made on the local level by these local synods. And then sort of, they've almost testing grounds for what might, might go up beyond that. Now that's got its own problems, but it seems to me that's sort of what's part of the uh, framework of this synodal impulse and is a, a somewhat decentralizing. Uh, yes. I'm concerned or it, I'm concerned about all the expectation people have of discussion, like your comments about birth control. Like I feel like Humani Vitae clearly dealt with the modern day context of that. But my concern is since you've been through general um, community things with the Jesuits. When we go to town on these very sensitive issues and we raise our expectations, are we expect to be heard? And then we come back to a reaffirmation of what the church has already always taught. So how did the Jesuit congregation handle those like how do you heal the wounds of everyone's expressing all these opinions and yet then how do you walk through the, your Jesuit congregation through that? How are we going to walk through part two of the synod yeah. when our all our deeply felt convictions on opposite sense, sides of the fence don't get reconciled? Well, that is a problem. And that's why I say that I really fear that part two of the synod is going to be a lot of disappointments because people have issues and they won't be 
dealt with or dealt with in the way they wanted and expected and so forth. So I think that's a big problem, that's a big danger of this way of going about things. Um, how do the Jesuits do it? Well, first of all, we're a relatively small body, right, compared with the Catholic Church, and a much more coherent body. So basically have the, sort of the same training and so forth, the different nationalities and different viewpoints, all, all of that, but still much more coherent and more tightly organized. So uh, at the General Congregation 32, uh, there was one this decree on uh, faith and justice. It was a hotly debated in the congregation, and once it was published, it was hotly, hotly debated within the Society of Jesus. People were very angry about it. Uh, but bit by bit, there were process whereby uh, this was explained and discussed and so forth in individual communities, and then a kind of consensus was eventually reached. But you can't do that with the church. It's too sprawling. So that's the other side. Yeah, that's the other side. But you know, I, I think it's interesting when we put all these surveys out, you know, asking people their opinion. And if you, if you do that, I think there's an expectation that there'll be action taken on that type of input. If you're not going to take any action, don't put a survey out. No. Or at least acknowledge. Yeah. yeah. Right. No, I agree with you. This raises all kinds of expectations. You filled out this questionnaire, and uh, then nothing changes. Well, maybe something will change. I don't know. I don't know. I can't. I don't predict the future. Whenever I predict it, I get it wrong. So, uh, one of my famous predictions was in 2005, they were asking me who the Pope was going to be when John Paul II died, and I said, well, it's an open field. Uh, it could be anybody, I can't even give you a single name, there are no front runners. The only thing that's certain is it will not be Cardinal Ratzinger. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how good I am at predicting. Uh, so, but, I mean, uh, the, I think there will be some kind of glacial movement, uh, and uh, it's a well, I think the one of the problems with the glacial movement, and just to, to take on the good doctor's comments here, if we take a look at contraception, and we take a look at how it's practiced, at least here in the United States, worldwide. and I'm going to say probably worldwide, I mean, it's certainly in conflict with what the church teaches, and yet, 90% of the population, parishioners, are basically thumbing their nose at it. Yeah. Well, that's a fact. <laughs> How do you reconcile that? Yeah, well, I, yeah. I, I, so this whole question of, you know, the sense of the faithful, and this is in Vatican Council too, and so forth, that, uh, uh, this is an important theological fact. Now, to get people to recognize this as a, as a, fa I mean, a fact that deserves theological consideration and uh, uh, to get that moving is beyond me. I don't know how you do that. But. <laughs> We've created a lot of sinners, though. Yeah. Well, well yeah. We that's what a ton of people that are sleeping around all over the place. We're not going to change our position on that. I mean, yeah. Okay, we don't we don't have to debate the debate. Yeah. 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 And then we're coming to an end here. Yeah, one, one more. Sorry. Notwithstanding or recognizing uh, the tendency of the Holy Spirit to be independent, to surprise, <laughs> and to not be able for humans to forecast, would you be willing to uh, to consider in your scholarly assessment of when the next council will be and what will be the theme? You want to ask me about Vatican III? Could it be north-south? Could it be east-west? I mean, would those issues be totally separate from what the issues we're talking about now? But say, where's the power in the church in terms of everywhere? Amongst people and the clerks in the church. I'm a layperson <laughs> myself. So I'm just asking. I'm, I'm totally blind. I don't, I don't have an answer. I don't know. Well, I wonder if there should be another council, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, the church is still, for instance, I mean, the traditional thing is principally of bishops. Well, there were about, in any given moment in St. Peter's, during Vatican II, there were about 2,000 bishops present in the Basilica. And that's almost capacity. Now there are about 7,000 bishops in the world. I mean, how do you, how do you deal with that? Uh, so maybe this thing of 
more local synods is the way to go in this, in this issue, or these synods that will you know, address more specific issues. So, uh, and certainly demographically, there's a big shift in the church. The growing Christian population, especially Catholic population, is in Africa, Korea, places like this. It's a big, big change. It's no longer a European, it's no longer a North Atlantic church. Uh, and that brings new issues and new concerns and so forth. So, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be fine. That's my prediction. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that's it. So thank you very much. Yeah.